I have a question. So that the link that's going on YouTube, is that being like tweeted or posted anywhere so people know where to access it? Or is that, that's just for us to post this there, right? Or on Transparency TV? Um, yes, it has been shared. Um, but um, yeah, we're live now. So people will be um, linking in through the YouTube channel and transparent.tv and this soon as well. Okay, yeah, it's live and it's recording, great. Okay, so <laughs> um, we are live. Welcome everybody um, to our panel discussion. Okay, um, let me just get my together okay so um yes we are live on transference.tv um my name's candice jacobs and i'm an associate lecturer at central st martins and i've been working um, with students across the ma fine art ma contemporary photography practices and philosophy and ma um, art and science uh, since january this year to develop and curate the ma online interim show which um, is now live as transference.tv. <clears throat> um, so I'd like to welcome our viewers watching through the online platform and to those also watching on the CSM YouTube channel. Um, we've been live since Monday and we're running to midnight on Sunday and transference.tv will host and is hosting the work of um, 100 first year MA students currently developing their practice exhibiting work as live broadcasts, downloadable artworks, as geolocated work, and as artworks located within a variety of different rooms, accessible by clicking on different satellites um, that are currently orbiting the globe. Transference.tv considers the transferal of ideas and the sharing of knowledge as moments that create possibilities and build support structures that are needed now more than ever before. And due to physical distancing measures under COVID, we're finding ourselves in this increased condition of gathering online, including um, both learning and social situations, which has rapidly resulted in this settlement of a monoculture of mediated experience, a critical flatness, if you will, turning all interactions into business transactions as we accelerate this normativity of using platforms associated to big tech, which is predominantly a white male landscape, and um, as we give ourselves over to big data, where our identities are um, potentially uh, only worth about two pounds a day. So isn't it urgent, therefore, um, to find new ways to explore this landscape of remote working and video calling? What does it mean for artists to use the digital space of the internet in our COVID world today? I'm scared that this notion of critical flatness may come to erase diversity and deepen the structural dependency um, and, uh, the provoke, and provoke a relational kind of precarity to a techno-colonial regime that passes through this deadly environmental zone and um, kind of touches on exploiting our, our forms of labor. So perhaps we should be asking, um, what are the potentials of the devices we have around us? How might we look over, um, around or underneath these digital infrastructures? How might we challenge or make use of um, or destabilize what we know of these linear structures and devices that are connected to our concepts um, of reality, uh, time, space, labor, and notions of human and non-human beings that radiate energy out into the atmosphere. So I'm extremely pleased to be hosting this panel discussion today where I'm hoping that some of these ideas can be flashed out a bit further. Um, I am joined with Art Programme Director at Central St. Martin's, Alex Shady, and six students across the three MAs, Michaela McLucas, Kamala Geraldo, Shivani Matur, Laurent Logoff, Alberte Agaskov, and John Costi, who will be introducing themselves shortly. So um, throughout this week, and there's still three days to go, we've hosted around 80 live broadcasts of performances, talks, and video works, 
that have included the screening of a work by Diane Bauer, which was created when she was artist in residence at the CERN Institute. Um, and we screened a talk by Diane and Helen Hester, who are founding members of Laboria Carbonics, um, who developed the manifesto Zeno Feminism, a politics for alienation. We've also had nearly um, 1,000 downloads and 10,000 views. And we've hosted artist talks with invited guests, Kate Cooper, who's just been selected for the New Museum Triennial in New York um, and is a founding member of Auto Italia in London. Um, and Hannah Perry, who's currently developing work for her upcoming solo show at the Baltic. And Joey Holder, who's currently exhibiting at 17 Gallery and has been selected for the forthcoming British Art Show. And um, out of those talks, some really interesting ideas got touched on that um, made me think about um, a couple of references, including Hito Sterl's um, In Defense of the Poor Image, Karen Barad's book Meeting the Universe Halfway and her essay on touching, Donna Haraway's notion of speculative fabulation, ideas of reality manipulation and post-truth theories, um, the idea of the alter ego and identity shape shifting in terms of a collective body in digital space and feminist and gender politics. So let's press pause for a moment. Breathe. <sighs> Inhale and exhale the charged atmosphere that surrounds you. Feel your body. Connect to the firing synapses in your mind and enter into the transference of thoughts and ideas being presented to you. Trust your instinct. The energy you have and the attention you give and the value systems that you put in place act as evolutionary tempos and rhythms of extinction. The digital world is a place where attention has a flat structure. Silence and muteness have no place. We must communicate. We cannot remain silent because we are subject to the compulsion of communication and the compulsion of production. Stop, listen, embrace, share, support, connect, transfer, become, end. Now I'll pass over to you, Alex. Thank you, Candice, uh, and thanks for that introduction. Um, how to respond to that in a way. I'm, I'm, okay, well, the first thing I wanted to say was the, one of the things I found exciting about the opportunity to, to view the exhibition and discuss the exhibition is that it presents a very different approach to how the interim show would normally manifest. And I guess just to put that in context, so that people have a sense of where that's come from. Typically, the interim show is something that happens halfway through the MA process and it happens in, uh, in public view, but typically in a physical space. Um, where we would have perhaps maybe three days to set up the show, four days for the show to be on, and then maybe a day and a half, two days to take it down, and that's the show. Um, lots of people come for the private view. Um, lots of drink is drunk. I'm not sure how much the work is seen, but, but uh, there's excitement certainly for the interim show. Um, and then that's it. And then on the days that it's open, perhaps we get people coming through. If the students uh, involved in the show are particularly active, they might bring the set of guests they would like to arrive at that show to come along to it. And if not, then perhaps there's a hope that someone will, will stumble upon it. And there's some stumbling, but not maybe as much as one might hope. And then COVID happened. And so suddenly that COVID, that, that version of the interim show wasn't possible. We couldn't have a, a space with people coming and going. We certainly couldn't have a space full of people and drink and excitement. Um, so what could we have? And Candice, I approached you and, and we had a conversation about what the possibilities might be in, in this new realm. And I'm not, just to say, I'm just completely bowled over by what Transparency V has managed to do because it seems to me that it's describing a new site of production and a new site of encounter for art. Um, and perhaps not one that's entirely visible to me yet, but perhaps one that is one about sort of setting up a set of uh, potential green shoots, a set of avenues that might be explored, that seems very distinct and very different to what uh, was the prevailing method before. And why is that significant? So one of the ways in which we might measure the success of a show, or one of the ways in which institutionally, and I'm, I'm not gonna say one institution or whatever I mean by that just yet, we might measure the success of a show, 
would be how many people came, how much work was sold. And that's such a depressing way to, 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 to decide whether something has or hasn't um, been a success. Um, how might we measure the success of something like this? I don't think it's about people coming. I don't think it's about, it certainly isn't about work selling, I don't think, but it might be about connections. And I think one of the things that it seems to me that Transference TV does terribly well is scribe a web. Um, perhaps you're saying the word network is too trite on the <laughs> worldwide web and networks, and, you know, but, but it does definitely describe a set of interconnections that might be possible. And it's funny that before we started uh, the, the discussion today, we were having a, 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 an informal conversation and someone was describing going onto the site and every time they go on it, they see something different. And that's absolutely the experience that I had of, of going on the website, that it isn't a set route, it isn't a um, singular view, it's a set of possibilities that gets described. Um, I want to slightly touch on one thing that I think we might touch on later, but I'm not gonna to say too much about that. And that is that I think there's something, um, uh, I'm gonna use the word mystic, Candice, to describe your introduction, to describe some of the elements of um, uh, uh, the, 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 the show. And I think that's interesting because it's not, a mysticism that is about escaping reality or about avoiding what's going on. And it's not a mysticism that's about um, uh, being unable to acknowledge what, what the here and now is, but rather it is, seems to me to be a mysticism that's about new formations of knowledge, new ways of constructing knowledge that are not dependent on uh, a scientific enlightenment model. And that to me seems like a really, really exciting uh, affirmative gesture that this show does. Um, I've got about 400 things I want to say, but I'm not going to say them all now because I suspect that they'll open up in the discussion. But what I am going to say is one last thing, and that is in, in praise of silence. One of the things I found incredibly <laughs> frustrating, exciting, interesting, odd about this new way of being is, is that this Zoom format for discussion uh, sets up quite odd um, new uh, challenges. In a room full of people, um, if I'm excited about something, I'm quite chatty, I'm quite loud, I think, um, I can probably just go oh, 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 and say something. And perhaps I can't in a Zoom encounter because actually how you talk over one another or don't talk over one another or, or where someone butts into someone else is quite, is quite strange and interesting. And it's perhaps made me think a lot more about think, uh, listening than it has about talking. Um, and one of the joys I've had in, in lockdown, and there haven't been very many because it's been fairly bloody, is in a meeting full of people when suddenly the conversation stops, and I'm going to do it now. And that's happened again and again and again in Zoom meetings I've experienced over the last 12 months. And that never happens in a meeting face to face. Somebody always fills the silence. I fill the silence. I don't, I get nervous of it. And I, so I fill it with something silly rather than wait for the silence to happen. And something about this format has allowed silence a physical uh, space. And, and I think that's really interesting. Um, I'm not gonna say anything more now because I've, I've got a lot to say, but perhaps I should be reined in. But I am going to pass over to, to our students who are going to introduce themselves and say hi. And um, Laurent, perhaps I'll start with you, just because you're, you're first in my, in my list here. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm uh, Laurent, and I'm a costume maker and textile artist. Uh, I'm currently pursuing a postgraduate research on the relation between textile ornament and uh, the, un the environmental crisis. Um, so I mean the MA art and science. Uh, I'm like the, 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 as a textile artist, the pandemic took me on asking myself new questions about materiality uh, and making new work uh, more related with the digital, uh, like this lace that is around me and eating me <laughs> uh, on the screen. Um, and yeah, like questions that I hope we will have um, we will unfold together tonight. Uh, so thank you everyone for being here and thank you Candice and Alex uh, for creating all that. Uh, 
um, the Caleb. Oh, do you want to pass the pattern? Yeah, you pass it on as you, whoever's on top of your Zoom list. All right, uh, so Michaela. <laughs> you might need to unmute yourself. Classic. Classic. <laughs> I'm never silent, so that's obviously a giveaway that the button's off. Um, my name is Michaela. I'm from Los Angeles, and I'm currently in London. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist who works with connection, ecstasy, and feminist theories tying into identity, especially within um, new digital media. And prior to the pandemic, most of my work and my research was about rave culture and traveling around the world. So. I've completely had to invert and reflect on myself and reflect on how we do um, connect to each other and, and to ourselves, especially. And that, that was the biggest thing that I've learned out of this. So doing my MA throughout all of this has been really interesting and all the new ideas that we've all gotten to share with each other through this platform. So yeah, that's me. Okay. So I can, I can toss up now, yeah? Oh, there's no one above me. All right, Cam, your turn. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I'm Kamalish. Um, I'm on the MA Contemporary Photography course. Um, my work deals a lot with collective consciousness and memory, which is, I feel like, something that's really relevant now. I'm specifically interested in things like non-hierarchical archives, so the body as an archive, and how trauma and memories are passed down through the body. And something that's really interesting to me right now is how um, our collective memory is currently being shaped by the pandemic, because it is a huge thing that we're all experiencing at once, but in different ways. Um, and yeah, I find it really fascinating how, although we're moving into this digitized world or digitized um, art world for us specifically, everyone's really obsessed with nostalgia and fixated on the past and what is materially tangible. For example, in fashion, like the rise of archival fashion or the use of vintage aesthetic and photography and video and things like that. So maybe those are some things we can talk about. And I think I will pass it on to John. Hello, my name is John Costi. I'm born and raised in London. Um, my practice is predominantly participatory so you can imagine how uh, difficult that's been to kind of um, translate for a screen. I've just been playing with myself basically uh, for, for about six months. Um, my practice is kind, is kind of deals with my uh, status as an ex-convict um, and criminal justice and how I've healed myself through making art. Um, and this is, this is my world that I've created for now. It's kind of a pilot for, for a show that I call Bapu's Bubbles. And this is it. Uh, I'll pass it on to Alberta. Hi guys, my name is Alberte. I'm from Denmark. I'm studying MA Fine Art. And um, I come from working with a lot, very material based and working a lot with tactility in the form of our relation to whatever we touch, whatever we work with, whatever we're surrounded by uh objects we use in the everyday life and uh i've been working with sculpture and in clay stone sculpting and also fresco painting um and so for the interim show i decided to make a film to kind of adapt to the more digital media which was very very interesting for my personal practice um the current focus of my practice lies in an interest in relations between human and matter and how uh, this aware sort of making, interacting and using of objects and places can lead us to maybe a higher awareness uh, in ecology and, and uh, identity uh, of the world we live in as much as ourselves in a kind of more non-anthropocentric viewpoint. Um, do we miss anybody? Are we, or did we all? Shivani. Hi, I'm Shivani Mathur, and I'm honored to be here tonight. Uh, Loro and I are 
here with loads of questions from our cohort in the MA Art and Science. My own background is in psychology and in finance, and I worked 25 years as an investment banker. So yes. Um, now, Transference.tv, I think, is a fantastic digital platform uh, to contemplate how we've begun to do things differently in this lockdown. Because lockdown has been quite a transformative process. I think, I think it's pretty much very, very historic. And uh, in many spheres, opposite things have happened. The world has become so fragmented with COVID, and yet it's become joined with technology. We've had quarantine on the one hand, and despite that, I have never felt more connected socially with people all over the world because, you know, digitally it's just become so much easier. So in this world where inequality is widening, I want to use art to find answers and ask questions on how things can be so inspiring and so disorienting at the same time. What can we do to bring back balance? Um, how can we, you know, reinstate progress in a way that's sustainable and ethical? And these are the questions I would like to raise today in the panel. For the show itself, I began working on the 11th of January this year. I started a silent dialogue. I know a lot has been said about silence earlier by Alex and by Candice. So I started a silent dialogue in which I would send somebody a painting or a work of art with no accompanying text. And soon I found that the artwork became subsidiary and the dialogue itself became a work of art. And that's what I put out in transference.tv. So for me, I would like to discuss how lockdown and the digital age has changed us and how art has now become a currency to inspire and to stay inspired. Thank you. Great, thank you everybody. Um, there's some really great questions being um, raised uh, from each of you in relation to your own practices. Um, maybe, um, maybe we could start um, back at the beginning. Um, thinking about, um, Laurent, you were saying that you are kind of a textile artist and there's, there's something that kind of has come through a few of what you were saying about tactility and touch, something that Alberto was also saying and, and Michaela about the kind of intimacy of, of collective experiences. Um, yeah, kind of what is, uh, how do you think that this, this move um, that we've had to make during the pandemic, and we don't necessarily need to just focus on that, but how has it affected your, the relationship to your practice, this digital landscape um, in relation to tactility? Um, and touch. Maybe um, that could be a starting point for, for our discussion um, to move forward. Um, if Laurent or Michaela or Alberta, you wanted to follow on from that. Um, yeah, I think, I think I, I, before the pandemic, I didn't even realize that much uh, how my work was definitely linked with the, the human senses and like the, the need for texture, for like, just like feeling feeling something, having it in your hands. Uh, and I, I found myself uh, stuck with artwork that I created uh, at home that were like very small because it's like lace. So it's, yeah, it's like nine centimeters by something. And it didn't like make sense to just take a picture of it because like you couldn't like understand the the, the different properties that that were uh, that were the the artwork itself, um, and so it was it was very interesting like, and it brings so many diff so many so many new questions to my work, um, and also just like the the subject itself because uh, for transfers TV I um, I created a, a QR code that is supposed to be an interface, but then because I created by making a lace, it, it became a real physical object that you could play with and have it in your hands. And it will not uh, serve the purpose of being a QR code. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll be happy to have like other points of view because like mine, of course, like because I'm a textile artist is very like centered as, of, in, in this question of um, feeling and texture and materiality, but um, yeah. And yet textiles 
is also um, a code. You know, if you look at, for example, the um, knitting patterns, they're extraordinary and they're beautiful and they, and they are literally a code. It looks, it looks like binary code, but you know, and, and, and the web of, an, of, a, of a textile is not a million miles away from pixelation. So in a way, the question I'd like to throw at the group is, in relation to this is, what's the materiality that this affords? What is, is there a new materiality that, that, that happens in, in, in this web digital format? And actually, I think even, even, and I can't quite get my head out of it, I, I'm very stuck in the digital analog divide. I think that's no longer applicable. I don't think there is a divide. I think they, 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 they whiz around in, in relation to one another. They don't separate. But, but have you discovered a new materiality in relation to, to Transference TV and this format that is happening here now or not? Yeah, I, I think, I, think I, I did definitely. Like I discovered a, a new, like, new subjects that that were not subject before like that were just like here but without being able to to see it properly as 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 art it, it's like you said shimani with your dialogue it's like because you have this uh, this this screen and this uh, digital thing uh, that you have that you have to use uh, suddenly what you what you've done uh, serve a different purpose and and he's um um yeah it's just like different <laughs> so the materiality could be at attributed to something more like a conversation a conversation can be a material thing now that maybe you wouldn't have considered before <clears throat> exactly has anyone else got anything they'd like to add in terms of that this idea of a new form of materiality yeah oh michaela john i can hear both of you um <laughs> Okay, I'll go. Um, no, I mean, going, going into that whole idea of like digital and analog and there's always this in between. So like my background was photography and there's a lot of people in my industry that work in purely in film. And then there's a lot of people that only work in digital and everything has always been separated. And I think the same thing with a lot of artwork, people that were traditional painters before, we never dare like learn how to paint on like after effects or something. There's so many new ways. And I think because this has forced everybody to look at the screen is not just this um, separation of things. I think it's become more fluid. And I think in a sense, it, it forces us to look at and think about everything in, in a more fluid way. It's not black or white, one or the other. I think it, it, it all kind of has to come together. Like I did a meditation, not a retreat, but I did a few classes like through the London Buddhist Center, like online and there were, 350 people all meditating at the same time. And it was insane. And I never thought I would never, ever, ever have done anything like that before. And it was so bizarre because it's like Alex was saying before with the silence, but at the same time, you know, we're all together and we're in this digital space, but we're connecting in a physical way as well. So I, I feel like it's kind of forced everybody to rethink everything and even, um, you know, the self how you show yourself and how you're always online and even people that didn't use zoom before you know we're always here so now you know you kind of have to deal with that separation and even questioning what that means to always be online and choosing not to be online when everybody else is john you what you had something you wanted to yeah i, I was going to say that um quite paradoxically it led me to working more with my hands um because before um before COVID, a lot of my, my artwork was based on um, sort of making assisted ready-mades with, with participants. And then I did, obviously I didn't have that um, option anymore. So I, start, so I started actually dressing a set and working with my hands. And, and that, that, that then really made me think about how I framed my world or my, you know, my, my work and where I sat within it. So it, it, it didn't, and it, I mean, it pushed me to sort of update my website, um, but that's but that's all it really done for me. Uh, it kind of it, it made me want to it made me want to sort of go back to basics and actually, you know, be playful with materials as opposed to be playful with objects, which I was kind of used to doing. Um, yeah, and that's 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 my stance on it. Yeah, 
It's quite nice that you're sat there with hands in front of you and you said it's made you make more with your hands, like your actual yeah. hands or those hands that are in front of you. These and, are great. And you're sitting inside your world. You use those terms, but you are actually sitting inside your world. <laughs> yeah, um, this is, there's lots, there's lots and lots of stuff in here. Um, but that's, that's uh, for people to find out on, the, on Transference TV. So we've got um, Cam, Shivani and Alberta who have got their hands up. Yeah, I think I completely agree with John that um, this shift to the digital world or like to existing and communicating digitally has made me want to do things physically more. I find myself overexerting myself in a way that's almost unhealthy because I just crave to touch things and experience that. And when Michaela was talking about um, shifting to the digital world and how there isn't a divide and how we have to sort of make it more fluid, it brings the idea of accessibility to me. What about these people who traditionally make things by hand and haven't jumped on the learning curve yet, don't have access to internet, don't have access to a laptop, um, don't know how to use these new technologies to display their material work online and how can we push those boundaries further to make it more inclusive and of course we don't have all of the answers but I think that's something that we're responsible for as artists who have access to these resources so if anyone I think that's a really, important, a really important point and one that I think we should we should come back to um, and I guess but in relation to that point we must always consider access to art at any point. I think there's a temptation yeah. to imagine that what was before was access and now it's gone. And actually access mm -hmm. is, a, is a permanent question. It's the question that needs to be questioned and struggled and worked through again and again. But it's absolutely vital that we don't fall into the trap of simply saying, oh, well, everyone's got a phone, they can all do it. Because absolutely exactly. not. Absolutely, that is not the case. So, mm -hmm. so thank you for bringing that to the, to the table. Um, Shivani and then Albert. Yeah, oh, sorry, Shivani. Uh, want... Thank you, Alex. You know, it's so interesting listening to Cam because uh, what I found was that, in fact, I reacted the opposite way. For me, I moved away from materiality. And for me, art is a way to touch somebody's life. So how can I touch their life as opposed to create an object? That's what became my focus. And I noticed two things, and I think, I think John touched on it a little bit earlier. The first is that when you move from material work to digital, or even if you photograph a material and you know, sh like transmit it digitally, there are two things that that become completely out of whack, and one is scale. So, you know, I love doing really large work, but honestly, when I put really large work, people think I've made like a five by seven inch painting when it's actually six feet by <laughs> by five feet. So, scale ceases to matter in the digital world. And the second thing is context becomes really important. So for example, I've made a metal sculpture and I sent photographs of that to people. And I thought, you know, oh, I've done this metal structure. It's so much hard work, how fantastic. I'm really happy and I'm really proud and all that. But what people noticed was not the metal sculpture I made. They noticed the building in the back or the composition of the photo that I took. So I thought this is really interesting how, how differently artwork makes communicate and perceive the 3D, 2D aspect starts blurring. So yeah, that's just my experience. I couldn't agree more with what you've just said. And I think it's worth noting that in uh, perhaps in image making, we've experienced that sense of uh, a sort of mutability of scale, say in the photographic, sculpturally, that same question of being brought into sculpture through, through 3D modeling, 3D printing, and it's very intriguing what it's doing to our vision of the world. I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, I won't say any more on that just now because, um, Alberta, we've, we're over to you, please. Yeah, um, I think what John says and Kamalish about kind of engaging even more with, with the body and the, the senses in this moment is also because um, somehow it seems that this memory we've got, the digital memory, it's accessed by all of the tactile memories that we've made in our lives. So uh, saying like when somebody says soft or when you see Shivani's metal uh, 
uh, sculpture or I see Kamalish's uh, amazing interactive website. Like it's all like when I see a picture of a plastic uh, bottle or a, a fried chicken or something, I remember maybe if I'm lucky or otherwise, you know, I put like a, my nervous system makes up a memory, but it will always be a memory for from the real life. And I, I think that's why we can't separate these two things. Uh, because it will be a making up of memories that we already have of what is soft, what is hard, what is cold. And that will then connect with how soft makes me feel normally, you know. So, so, so it is very interconnected and I think we should be very aware of that. We cannot part it. That sense of memory of what, or, or context or what we bring to something is something that a number of people have brought up already. Um, Permit me one indulgence. I just want to do one quick thing, just to show you what, what, what I've been thinking about in terms of materiality. And that was that, that it might work the other way around, that actually we might bring material to this. And what I, what I was doing was, was made, I made a film with a group of students where we just did this. We just put a straw up to the... <laughs> You get the idea. But there was a possibility of Zoom itself becoming its own materiality, that the possibility of the web camera itself has a materiality. And I agree with, with, with both with what Cam said and what John said in terms of a yearning for something physical, but that, that physicality is in a sense made difficult by the, 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 the glass, the screen that separates us. But if the glass that separates us is its own materiality, there's a potential maybe for uh, activating it? I don't know. I'm hopeful, I guess, is what I'm saying about that, 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 that site. Yeah, that was something that I was thinking about as well in terms of the Transferent TV site um, and having the element of kind of uh, the desktop section where you can download people's work and then have it on your devices because, you know, we do have this intimacy with our phones, you know, it's tactile. They've been designed, there's a process they've been through. There's kind of a sexiness to them, a glossiness to them. What does it mean to then have someone's artwork being displayed on your phone and to look at it every day or on your desktop, you know, you, and to be able to change that. Um, I've been changing them uh, around quite a bit. And I don't know, it's just lovely. I, there's, yeah, so um, uh, there's something about the device being a new form of material as well. And it's called touch technology for a reason. Lauren, you've got your, you've got your um, hand up. Yeah, because like, uh, as you were talking about the, the materiality uh, of, of, of the, the, the camera, I like, I just wanted to bring the fact that we um, almost forget the materiality of the, the devices that we're using and like the fact that they have an history as well. And that, you know, all of the environmental impact that the e-waste can generate uh, more like the da data part and also like just the devices itself and like the where, um, materials that are needed to to create uh, one one computer or, or, or one one phone or whatever um, so yeah I just wanted to bring that that up as we were talking of the materiality of the device that we are using tw twice or three eyes more than usual especially this year uh, and it's kind of the you know like the counterbalance of all of this uh, great thing that can happen with, with the digital and this kind of new playful era that is also part of the uh, more global problem that we have with the the environmental crisis and and and, and social as well uh, because like it it will always uh, sadly uh, be the the like the developing countries that will end up with with the 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 e waste of like all of the world which doesn't make any sense um, yeah I think that's a really important point to raise oh yeah no my mic's on um, a really important point to raise to run especially today is Earth Day and there's the climate um, conference going on in America, trying to kind of um, change, um, you know, the big countries that are contributing towards the climate crisis, change their, their attitudes towards what they're doing. So yeah, it's often something that goes um, unnoticed and, you know, um, it, we, we're not widely aware of, of that waste and of the amount of energy that it takes to 
um, store all of these informa this information, all of these images, um, all of the warehouses with hard drives in, you know, like um, it, uh, the cables that go under the ocean to connect us globally. You know, there is a physical motion to the digital. Um, I don't, I don't know how to raise my hand, but I've just got a little comment on that. Okay, yeah, uh, go ahead. That I spent, it was about two or three years ago, it was a comment, it was a project about touch and touch in a technological world. And I, um, I did a project where I basically got, I think it was like 250 iPhones and deconstructed them and arranged them in a kind of a tower on a flat surface. And, um, and they were all broken, so I just bought them from eBay. But in order to put them on the surface, I had to deconstruct them. And it took about three or four days of just deconstructing these iPhones with a pair of pliers. And I ended up with cuts all over my hands, like minor cuts, I had glass in my hands. Um, and I was basically taking apart, even just because I didn't have the backs, I just had the front of the iPhones. And even those, even just the fronts, they have about 20 different components um, minimum. And it it really, it, at the time I actually wasn't dating anyone and I, I hadn't really had any human touch at that point in that week. Um, and I'd been touching these phones day in, day out. And it really, really made me crave um, human connection in a much more deeper way. And I was really surprised because that was the intention of the project. So the process of kind of deconstructing these items amplified that need. And I think it's something like there's a statistic, which is the average person touches their phone 2000 times a day. Um, and that's only due to get bigger. So um, as we use our phones more and more for more things. Um, and when I mapped it across, you know, a day in the life of, I found that human touch um, in the West, in the UK, was it was something less than 1% of the, the interactions that we were having. So it was just a really interesting kind of set of experiences that really made me think about that interaction with technology in a completely new way and also in a, in a much more embodied way. That's fascinating. It's so interesting. Um, although I, I worry about your hands and all that glass in the, in the making of it. I hope they're all right now. Um, fine. I was broken though afterwards. <laughs> I had really bad back as well from bending over. <laughs> Well, I think that, that links into the labor, you know, the, the, again, this association with labor and, you know, the, the hidden costs associated with, with technology. Um, yeah. And, and I think this question around um, the impact of something relates to what you were talking about earlier and, and to labor in terms of a, a sort of compulsive neurotic relationship to production that we have to be producing, we have to be connecting, we have to be... And then actually, on the one hand, we might tell ourselves, oh, we're not producing anymore because look, we're online, it's all, it's all uh, virtual. But actually, as is already pointed out, it's not. The, 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 these things are st there's still a sort of production uh, uh, machine at, at work. And perhaps that does, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm being fanciful here, but perhaps it does relate to silence. Perhaps there might be a silent non-production that would be uh, something that would be intriguing. Maybe we need to... Uh, um, be silent both visually and, and audibly for moments to, to, to allow, what would happen if that happens, if we, if we don't do anything? Um, the silence but, becomes a form of material and becomes something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the danger, isn't it? That there's always a sort of a push to, yes, yes. Um, uh, Shivani and Alberson. No, yeah, Alex, there was just coming back to this materiality of the digital that I think is quite interesting if we tie it up to what Laura just said about the phone and, and about how many times we touch a, a phone a day, let alone how much we look at a screen, let alone how many different images we look at in one day, okay? So, like, if our mind has to engage with, uh, with all of these materialities that... I'm still questioning myself what that means, you know, because, um, yeah, in my film, I tried to, for example, embrace that and, you know, reach those memories. And, and also the, as you, your straw experiment there, you know, a new materiality, but, you know, how can we uh, choose, like curate ourselves, what we use, we, we will then, you know, take in as a materiality to let, like tactile, tactile, 
like tactile wise no how what can how can i choose what touches me and what doesn't out of those three like a hundred thousand different materialities then that pass through my mind in a day and definitely that sense of the amount of ex contact points uh, links webs images that is something that's so current as a, as, as a sort of problematic notion at what point and, it, and i was wondering at what point too much reverts to zero this there are so many images that i don't see any in there's so many contact points that i notice none of them but that's that i'm really intrigued by that shivani yeah alexa i mean if you think about materiality as something that occupies time that takes space and you know has some sort of an impact I mean, we all know how much time it takes to even make a video out of any work you've produced. So I think it's very, very material, the digital work. And in terms of um, like, you know, the impact on the environment, I mean, these days the rage is the NFTs. And if you see how much of, how much of destruction one single NFT is doing, like with a blockchain, it's just like consuming so much electricity. So I think in terms of very, very like nut and bolt terms, it's just a different materiality. It's not the same materiality as before, like, but it's different, but it's there. And it has an impact on the earth. It has an impact on our time. It has an impact on the space that we occupy, you know, how we interact. So I think it's just the shifting change in, of, change in of definition of materiality that's for whatever it's worth like. That's the way I look at it. I, I, think, I think you're right. I think you're right there. There's something really interesting in it. Um, I just want to mention something that, that Laura Melissa has been, been uh, speaking about in the chat that seemed really interesting. She um, says here, it would be interesting, oh no, we'll go further back. What if we have a silent Zoom, no camera, no sound? It would be an interesting experiment and promote it as a component of a show. So more widespread as a, pro a provocation too. It be. Uh, yeah, and then, she, and then she puts her hand up. So, so I do think that the idea of a space that we would enter in which we can see and hear nothing. Um, my fear is that if we can hear and see nothing, our demons catch up with us. Maybe, that, maybe, maybe if we stop having things coming from outside, we, <laughs> our inside start to communicate with us, but it's certainly an intriguing provocation. You know, there's something interesting about kind of entering into the ether and thinking about this new form of materiality and thinking about the envir environmental consequences of devices and their production, but also um, of data and data being this kind of, um, uh, <clears throat> just, by, just by participating, just, just by um, logging into that Zoom, even though there's no cameras and no sound, you know, your, your, your labor is being, um, valued and being attributed a value and there's a cost attached to that and I kind of touched on that in the introduction in terms of um in terms of our kind of value systems and and this kind of um um you know this kind of big data and and ourselves being part of a labor force that are providing for the big corporations um and I'm i challenge that then How, what would be the version of it could we all agree to be silent in front of an imaginary camera that is not really there? Or, or... I think the way out of it is the new form of luxury, which is, you know, what many people are doing now is that they're buying experiences um, where they take your, their phones away from them when they go into these places and there's no connection to the internet. Um, it's, a, it's a, you know, a um, conscious uh, withdrawal um, yeah, where you're not activating something, where you're not allowing something to perform. Um, well, that's like, um, yeah, John. I, I, I recently deleted Instagram um, and only just downloaded it again on Monday to promote for the show. And because and I, I was spending 12 hours a day or something ridiculous like that, over 12 hours on screen time on my iPhone, it was telling me. And Every time I was reaching for for, for for Instagram, I then I then just start researching things that I was interested in instead, and that that the the kind of um, reflex of, of to put my hand in my pocket and grab my phone was was completely ingrained by 
by scrolling and, in, and, and the nature of Instagram. And now I feel like there was so much, it was just such a dark hole, Instagram now. Whereas before I was like, okay, this is how I'm going to live my life. Through, I'm going to live my life through Instagram now. And I, 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 it, it, really, it really bummed me out in the end uh, that, that I was sort of, I felt that I had to update people with what I was doing. And really, that's not how we connect. I don't think, I, I like, there's, this, there's always this illusion that, that oh, I've, I've just seen my friend's story. So I've seen them, but I haven't seen them for like two years. But you feel like you've connected with them, and that is that's that's a that's a trick, you know. That's that's a trick, and and so so when the, when we say that the internet has made everyone connected again, but I I can't I can't read a person through a screen, you know. I and even especially with with like poetry or or being on a stage and reading an audience, which was kind of where I was at before COVID. That like to read an audience is now imp impossible as as we unless maybe we've got loads of silences on on Zoom, but even the silences on Zoom are not necessarily negative because people don't want to kind of people don't want to jump in front of each other and 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 all that as well. So it's it's a uh, I, I just I think I guess I just want to get back to um, being in a physical space with other people um, ultimately. That we've got Michaela Shivani, but we've also got Patty, who's made a number of points that I think really relate to what you've just said. Could we, could um, Jessica, is it possible to give Patty access to, to, to the mic so that she can just jump in? Because um, is that all right, Patty? Are you happy to talk to what you've said, or, should, or do you, would you rather I talk to it? So I'll just mention what you've said then, Patty, in the chat. And then if you have any point you want to turn your, your mic on and just talk, feel free to talk over me, because I think it's really important what you've said. Um, uh, I'm just going to go back to where the first one is. So, um, da -da 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 -da. it's like Max Planck wall in, in a Debordian world. And I, 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 could, it, I, I need more info on that, because that's a reference that I'm slightly guessing, but not getting entirely on top of. So if you could bring that into us, that would be really fascinating. And then you... Um, Nous ne voulons pas plus travailler au spectacle de la fin du monde. Mais la fin du monde du spectacle. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I had to pay for it. I was, I'm an apologist. I was, uh, I was on mute and I, parallelly, I was actually working as well. Okay. Uh, I think the discussion we're, we're leading here is really around the, the idea of a spectacle and in a Debordian sense, into how we communicate feelings and, uh, uh, and the world to, to each other. Uh, and so in that sense, Max Planck's wall is like this limit of what do we do with the productivity? Do we deny it? Do we, um, do we not participate in it? Do we destroy it? Or do we just push forward? Um, and with the dig digital world and developing of the new technologies, I feel like, um, I feel like we probably reached the point where we have no other choice. We just have to be gentle to the resources and environment we're working with in that sense. I think that's really beautiful and important. I think that's a sense of being gentle matters massively right now, actually. Um, and I, and I th I'm sure that's something we'll come back to. Um, and, and sorry, and just in terms of the Mac plans also, it's like kind of a limit where you've reached the, in the quantum where you no longer know where you are. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen what happened to Guy Debord and, and his anti-materialism and the way how you know, they try to hijack the reality through situations and performance, etc. But we've come to the point where, where we are part of a spectacle. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, good point. Very well made. Um, Michaela. Well, I feel like we've totally diverged from what I was going to say. But um, going back to what John said just quickly, um, I we're stuck in this digital way, but I don't think we can just unplug like Candace was saying. Like it's fascinating how I've seen in like Australia, there's these like resorts where you pay like three grand to like take your phone, get your phone taken away from you. But even if you choose to unplug and not partake in this, like that conscious choice, you're still you're still involved because you're still thinking about it and you're still wondering about what you're missing and you are missing stuff. There, there's so many articles about people unplugging and how many friends they've lost, how many connections they've lost. And I don't think it's even a choice anymore. You know, it's like whether the machine has taken over from the human self, right? Like what, what does it mean 
even for example, I was watching TV the other day and I could hear a phone buzz, but not even a ringtone. It was a bzz, bzz, and you know what it is. And then you get anxious and you check your phone. And I think it did it about five different times throughout the film. And every single time I check my phone and it wasn't me. And it's just, we're so wired to it now. And I think there's no pulling away from it. So I think, you know, you have to learn to adapt and you have to learn to be conscious of the material world and the digital world and yourself and your connection to it and each other. And, you know, this is a new hybrid way, especially now after the pandemic, like there is no going back. You know, sometimes this is all we have is this Zoom call. People that haven't seen their parents like me in like a year and a half, you know, this is this is what it is. So how do we use this? Like you were saying before and, and flip it, right? Flip, flip the, the medium itself, right? All we have are these webcams and these screens. So what does that mean about our life and in our art making after that? Thank you. What, what does it mean to your life and your art making after this moment? I mean, I've had to think a lot more about myself in, in like a good way, not in a bad way, but like, I think I've had to rethink my relationships to everybody and into myself and my work. And, you know, what have we neglected before and what actually matters to us now? I think um, it's done me really well with my, with my artwork. Cause I think before it was so easy to be stimulated outside. Whereas now the lacking of things makes you build new connections. And I think that's the thing that's really important. I feel like things maybe got sterile for a bit. And now that we're in these weird voids, you know, we're forced to think and, and be uncomfortable. And that really for an artist is, is the best thing that you can have. That, that discomfort is, is the crystallization, right? Um, Siobhan. Uh, oh, you're on mute. You're on I mute. agree very much with what Michaela is saying. Because I was wondering if I'm in the minority view. Actually, I find that this whole digital move is very, for me, it's a, it's a very contemplative. It makes me reflect inward. And I, I actually think that the code to connect with people is not gone. It's just different. Like, I mean, we all know that when you send somebody an SMS, you can actually get a sense of when they respond, how quickly they respond, you know, what they respond with. So there, there's a code that communicates the feelings too. It's just different from what it was in life, but it's there. And it's made me more reflective. And, and in many ways, I think, uh, you know, I, if you think about it, it's actually not a new format because, you know, when I started out very young, I, I was working in a bank. And at that time I was trading with people living in London or in they're talking on the phone 10 times every day. So I think the digital world is not losing materiality, but it's just making it different. Well, and it's up to us to sort of assimilate and sort of take the best out of it. So if we can turn reflective and turn inward and use it to touch people in different ways, um, you know, that's for me, I, I want to use art to do that. That's my exploration with art. John, you had something you wanted to bring in. Uh, the, well, what, what Barney was saying about the text messages and how quickly someone messaged you back and and that, that being um, a, a, a factor in, of how much they like you or, 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 or value you. But I, I, I think the energy fields are really important for me. When I meet someone, just, just, just from eye contact, is it's, it's a lot more telling than, than than a zoom meeting you know and 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 that's that's the thing that i think that i'm craving the most is is just to be able to feel someone's presence again because of even being in the studio and no one's there and you just kind of you feel like you're in a shared studio as opposed to being in a university half the time and and the conversations that we're missing out on uh, are the most important conversations the most important part of university i think is is to be with your peers and to kind of to, to mess around in the pub or to mess around for going for walks and, and, and figuring things out even outside of the studio context, because of then it sort of re re relieves you of the constraints of you, 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 this is education. And then that's, that's when I think that, um, did you just see that? Did you just see that flash? <laughs> no. No. Okay. So, so I was taking photos. Um, anyway. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of an anti, um, 
digital conversation now. But maybe that's because I've I felt like I've been betrayed not betrayed, but tricked by it too too much and felt that Instagram and 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 Zoom and all these things are, are real, but then they're, they're not real for me. They're they're just not real. They are they are they're they're, up, they're, they're kind of like archaeology of what what you make, I guess, that can exist in this digital plane. But I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to look someone in their eyes and say, "What, what's, what, what are you, what are you up to?" You know, like that simple. You know. What do you do if you can't have that? Like the thing is, that you don't have the real world right now. You don't have access to people. So what do you do? Just you, you can't this. do nothing. Yeah, I know that's great, but I'm saying like I think the option of choosing to completely like unplug from the digital and threat, like crave something that, you know, what do you have right now to work with, I guess. Right. I mean, that's what's in, for me, that would be an interesting thing to like see your perspective on like, what does well, it, you know, you don't, you don't have the pub right now. I mean, maybe sort of right now, but like, do you know I mean, you don't have those walks with your friends. You don't have anything that ha- was before. And it's not going, I hate when people say like, when things go back to normal, cause it, I don't yeah. think they're going back to normal. Yeah. No, I agree. this this is the the new normal. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> There's a message on the chat as well from Zana who says that sometimes these live conversations are are people's kind of um, you know only access to to you know when you you raised this as well, but it's only access to kind of touching and and kind of communication and and she raised the point of uh, people that have got anxiety and that these conversations um, through these platforms can be really useful for that. And I can see there's quite a few hands up, Alex. It's definitely noticeable that different groups of people um, are heard in different um, settings. And this setting does give a voice to certain people that might not be heard in other settings. So I think we have to, I think we have to be very careful not to present a hierarchy, not to say this is better than that, but rather to see it more flatly. But I do agree with John that there is something that drives me insane about Zoom, for example, is that it seems that sometimes these digital forms of communication are determined to make contact difficult. So why is it that Zoom doesn't keep the, the grid of people talking to one another consistent for everyone that's seeing it? Because if it was, I could go, Candice, you're there and I can see you're there. But I might, she might not be there for somebody else. Not down there. <laughs> it's infuriating that that's an opportunity for contact, for, for, and it doesn't do it. And Instagram seems to me to privilege the I, I, I of identity rather than the we, we, we. And I think that there's some responsibility within those mediums to shift them, to allow them to become more collective than they are at the moment. Because I do, th- I do agree with John, there is a problem with them. But I think that, but as Anna says, it, it, it definitely does give voice to different people, and that's really important. Sorry, that's it. But that's one of the issues that has come up is is that we're we're kind of restricted with, within the platforms that we can use to communicate um, digitally. Like there are, you know, only a handful of different ways that we, uh, you know, like Zoom or Blackboard or social media. There aren't really a huge variety. And for those panelists that um, are sitting on on the panel today, I, I sent. Um, some examples of some sites that are trying to um, give uh, access to some more kind of um, open source platforms for people to use that are outside of the the big the you know the big companies um, who have got the control. Um, I'm just aware that there's quite a few hands up, so should we go to some questions? Um, Cam has been for a while and she's had a hand up for a bit, so should we go to Cam then Albert then Laurent maybe perhaps? Is that does that seem fair? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up a point, um, just piggybacking off of what John said. I agree with you completely that I do crave the um, in-person communication, but I don't think that um, online or digital communication is fake. I've noticed that there is a huge shift in how people are communicating specifically on Instagram and, for example, platforms like TikTok. I have conversations with people that are exclusively going back and forth in memes. And I think what you said, Alex, is really important that social media platforms tend to privilege the eye. And I think that um, the proliferation of the meme is something that I've seen personally um, become more, it's more privileging the we. I think people communicate based on memes because of the immense pressure we're under because of the pandemic, economic hardship, we can't communicate or like touch each other. And we share memes to kind of make everything that's really difficult humorous. 
and it touches on what Shivani was saying about coded language and how on social media platforms, everything is coded. Like you post a story, it's coded. You're targeting a specific audience. You want people to see your story. You want more engagement. So you post your face as opposed to your work, things like that. Everything is super coded, but I think it's just a different, um, it's generational, I think, for a lot of people, but I think it's just a different form of communication. And I think a lot of people rely on it heavily on um, things like interacting or communicating solely through videos and memes and that kind of, um, yeah, just communication. Yeah, so like new forms of communication, new forms of language in terms of reading the body or reading expectations around the way that we communicate, whether that's through visuals or text. Um, there was uh, someone had their hand up who's I think has had their hand up for a while as well called DK. I just wanted to say one thing and that is that we've got a, an awful lot of questions coming through the chat here, an awful lot of questions coming through the chat on YouTube and conversations coming in. We may not get through all the questions today, but I just want to alert everyone to the fact that we're recording those questions and those questions will be added to the discussion once it's on online. So they're not going to be lost and they become their own conversation and apologies that we can't get to everyone. Sorry, Kendall. Um, no, that's fine. Um, someone had their hand up called DK that I think I saw a while ago. I just wanted to make sure that was... Um... Yes, it's me. Hi. Hi, Kendall. Hi. Hi, Anna. Just, just a quick thing, just that we're hearing everything about the media. And um, I think we shouldn't forget that, yes, now we are really feel really connected and empowered using the digital media, but just mostly because of the pandemic. Um, a while ago, when the telephone messaging came about, I think we were all really attached to the phone messaging for a long time. Then that switched to something else, then something else, something else. So I think we shouldn't forget that while communication changes, waves of communication changes, we still have our bodies. And somehow for some people, for me, for example, um, somehow I feel more empowered by using my body. When I go to the shop, I find myself talking to strangers much more. And I can see that those strangers are more acceptable to me asking these very simple questions about, oh, I don't know what to cook for dinner, for example. Very simple thing. I don't know the person's name. I have no idea who they are. And yet they'll say, oh yes, how about you get some peas? And click, we talk about stuff. And I will go away with my peas, that person will go away with the biscuits, whatever. We might never see each other again, but just that little smile and personal distance contact. And that dialogue is much warmer than anything that we see on Zoom, simply because it's not rational, it's not planned, we had no idea what we're going to talk about, and it doesn't mean anything. I think what the digital platforms create, they create very stressed meetings. We're all there to discuss certain things, or we want to plug in and, and really leave our mark. And when we're talking outside to strangers, we don't have that. It doesn't matter. What matters is a smile, a gesture, and we go on. And I think we shouldn't forget about that. That's all for me for now. Thank you. I think that's a really um, important point to raise. And, and what you're saying is that the, the, your connection to your community has has shifted through this kind of shift, uh, to this move online as well, and that these kind of um, incidental gestures become much more meaningful. I couldn't agree more. I think it's a sort of that sense of communicating or leaving our mark that becomes its own currency and it's problematic as such and actually um, miscommunicating, not being heard, forgetting, being forgotten are just as important. And, and there's a, we, we need to not, I find myself jumping to assert, to, 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 to think of something as positive inherently and actually to question that. Is it really, do we, should it, is it I think significant and important. I think that because there's also, you know, being on these platforms, like I was saying in the introduction, there's this kind of notion of, a, of it being a transaction, there being this kind of uh, related to business, like, you know, you might say, oh, I want to be heard or I want to leave my mark, but essentially it's like, you know, you're, you're buying into something, you need to be 
you know, be present. Whereas, you know, in other ways that we communicate, um, and John touched on this as well, you know, there's this is physicality um, where the, the kind of, you know, the not knowing um, becomes much more to the fore as well. I just want to bring in Alberta, who's had her hand up for a while. Yeah, um, it seems what um, Michaela and Shivani touched, which I, I totally agree that it's been a moment where this is really the only thing we, you know, the digital platform has been the place to gather. And, uh, and it still is in many ways, also for me and uh, with my parents and my family at home. Um, but I think it's important to also uh, what DK uh, came to remind us of is because I had exactly the same encounter, you know, and it's kind of uh, responding to, yes, let's be open to these new pl platforms, especially let's be open to how to make them even better and uh, not make them imitate real life, maybe not even call our exhibition rooms rooms because they're not, you know, maybe we could find an even better word for those. Um, so, 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 but, but, but to, to always make them better, but not to give up on the other kind of life that's out there and not say, okay, because we have to use this solution now, you know, that's not the, the real life is not there anymore because it really is and i think again drawing back to the beginning of our discussion if we don't interlace these two things and if we don't find a way to uh not have to pay anything for someone to put our phone away you know i i don't believe we have to i really really want to believe when that we can find a way to have both realities exist together and actually accept there's only one reality it's it's so interesting that you say that because it's basically the point where I wanted to come to is like when I was listening to uh, um, Michaela and, and John speaking a uh, few, few minutes uh, ago, I just, I was thinking that it's more about like finding some kind of equilibrium between like the two words, uh, the, the yeah, like the digital and the real thing, some kind of balance. But the problem in that is that the digital world is made like it has been created so that it has been shaped for humans to spend the most time possible on it it, it, it not it it not has been created as something where you can just like go for two minutes and then leave because like it's not it it, it was constructed to like for, I'm, I'm talking for like the main part of what we know of the of the internet of course not like it's not all like this but mainly the, the interfaces and the website that we're consulting are created to make us products and to, to make us stay longer and longer on, on the things that we're visiting. So it, it's why it's so complicated because yeah, like the solution would be to find a balance and to, and to interlace both. And, but there is such a dark side <laughs> of, the, of the internet and the interfaces and the devices that it's, so hard to do that because like even when you say oh i'm just going to spend two minutes on instagram you spend like 20 and it has been created for that like it's not like your fault or anything it's just like it's most like a systemic problem and and i think the solution is like there is no solution but like the like People have to be aware that the the the, the things that they are consulting on, on online have been created for for them to stay longer and 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 to be the product of what they are consulting and that's that's a very big problem because there is so many many beautiful projects and things that can be done with uh, open source and you know like all of those things that are amazing but it's not the majority. But I think that oh, sorry. I was going to just say quickly that um, Instagram and and these these uh, other websites, um, the they they may they may sort of we don't retain information from them like like we would if we was reading a book, and that's that's where I think my problem is like when you say you're going to spend two minutes on Instagram, but you end up spending twenty minutes, which is really going to spend twenty minutes, but really going to spend two hours. Um, that's that's where the problem is because it would be fine if if all of the information because the way it's designed to scroll and scroll and scroll is. It, it's not you don't take it in that's that's where my problem is and and also uh 90 of instagram posts 
are kind of you know they're they're falsified a lot of them I believe no that's a, that's a bit of a extreme statement but but a lot of them are falsified and and so we ultimately I feel like it's just a big waste of time to to to, to be doing that. That's a very subjective like take on it too though like you don't have to spend twelve hours on it like. I think I think you have to learn boundaries like with anything I, th I think especially with the way that we digest media but for example like our philosophy class is all online and we have a digital reading room and I don't have a printer and I don't think it's environmentally friendly either to print out 150 pages of a book every week to go through mm -hmm. so I think I'm not sitting here saying that like you know outside is is bad and, and the computer screen is good but what I'm saying is we need to recalibrate ourselves and understand like this is where we are right, right now and how how can we make the most of it and how can we take care of ourselves as well because I think there is a lot of psychological damage in in, in this this place that we're in right now but you know you mm -hmm. can't avoid it Instagram too you can choose you can curate and pick and choose how long you put your phone can even give you uh, time limits you know it'll tell you after 10 minutes like mm -hmm. I think it, it's something at some point you become accountable yourself for how, how much you adapt to it, how you use yeah. it good and bad. I, I, I think, um, I think I would like to um, add something quite, which I think is quite, uh, you know, quite, it sort of bothers me, which is that there are some things you can control and some you can't. So like what Michaela said, that you can, you can ration out how much time you spend. You can ration out how you interact. You can, you can ration many of these things. But one thing you can't is the kind of trail that you leave. So if I visit a site or if I have this conversation, I don't know who's taken a snapshot. I don't know where it's being recorded. And there's a host of privacy issues. And this whole thing ties in with this legal framework that needs to be sorted if the digital age is going to become more and more entrenched in our lives, which looks like it will. And, you know, I just want to throw up this aspect of it to the panel as well and to all the participants, just to see what everybody thinks. And, you know, because for me, it's not so much the rationing of time or the kind of the nature of the interaction. It's this aspect that bothers me the most. And, and that's, I guess, relates to, um, to a computational ability to scan that data. Because if the data is there, but we can't analyze it, we can't access it, it's neither here nor there, it's simply data. But if I can then scan to find where Shivani was looking at a particular moment, then suddenly it becomes, who, in whose hands is it? Um, but I do think that, that I don't know in myself what are, um, monstrous fears and what are um, genuine concerns. And I, I find it very difficult to disentangle that in, in my own thinking about, about um, uh, these new technologies, because they're always on new fears around new technologies. You know, the fear that the TV would burn your eyes, the fear that, the, that you know, trains would, you know, uh, go so fast that your, you know, your brain would fall out. But, but some of the fears are genuinely oppressive and problematic and create um, hierarchical regimes of oppression that then become uh, embedded in the way we, we formulate the world. And, and I guess it's, it's um, how, much, how much agency do we have to, to, to use these new technologies to make, unmake, undermine uh, the world we live in, or, or, or to what extent are we at its mercy? And I simply don't know. I suspect other people may, may, may have more confident assertions in that space. But I mean, I guess as artists, that's our whole point is continuing to experiment with everything in that sense, right? Like we have all of these things and we don't know where it's at, but we're way more free to, to play with it than other people. You know, there's less repercussions. It's begging for us to, to deal with it, you know? in all of our experiences, you know, we more than anyone are able to, to be fluid and to adapt and to question and to think and materialize these these emotions. And I think it's kind of up to us to lead everybody else, you know? And I think that's why there's so many interesting things going on 
with with um, digital art right now, not just talking about like NFTs, but in general, like how many galleries are showing digital work and how work is being archived and how it can be recontextualized later. Like the materiality of things, is everything is revolutionized so much. And I think artists are thinking about things in a much more forward and fluid and non-hierarchical sense than, than people are in the outside world. Like look at like, um, like in the tech world, it's very like tech bro, you know, there's these, hierarchies and these rules and these ways of being and I think they're they're being very futuristic and contemporary too but I think we're kind of breaking down everything that they're doing and, and putting it back together in a way that I think is going to help push the, the future forward in a more interesting way. I mean, I I that's... Yeah I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Sorry Alex. No, no, please, please. no I was just going to say like in terms of this kind of this moment of um you know, you you guys being the next generation, you guys being the people that can kind of challenge these these notions, these ideas, this this situation we're in, this lifestyle. It's like this collective moment, this collective experience where there's more awareness of being um, being addicted. Like maybe there's like a a, a need for a collective counselling to uh, deal with senses um, of addiction. Um, whether that's to do with, you know, touching your phone a million times or not knowing how to disengage. Um, and also this, uh, the, the way that we've been, our attention has been manipulated and used and abused. Like we're going through collective trauma that's associated with technology. I, I, think, I think that's absolutely the case. And, and if there's one thing that I think for me seems really potentially new about now, or maybe not new, but, but different to what was and exciting, it's that I simply don't know what the consequences of this thing is. And so it's, it feels like a lot of the things I thought I knew, I've had to unknow. A lot of the, the expectations I had have had to be unexpected. And, and I think that does creative, if not freedom, then an illusion of freedom, an, an illusion that there might be choice uh, or impact or agency or something like that. I think Francesco mentioned something about illusion in the, um, in the chat. Um, I've missed a few of the comments, where is it? And there have been some fantastic comments um, from, I know Francesco has made a number of really interesting points, uh, 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 as has um, Patty, and, and apologies if I've not been able to draw them all in. Um, yeah, I can't seem to find I, I them. Francesco, would you like to kind of come in and maybe say some, some of the things that you were mentioning in the chat? Okay, I will try. Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yes, That's I can, it. yeah. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say regarding the our experiences through meetings and yeah, the way we are all connected even right now. That to me, as I as I text in in a in a chat, uh, when we use those platforms, we have lots of expectations because I think we all have this belief uh, in, in this in our society that these machines has to be efficient and so I think that this can lead to to think that even our conversations should be efficient and that's this to me uh, connects to what uh, Alex said before about the silent moments. That is something that also happens in real life many times. And this is because life is open to the unexpected. And the unexpected to me is also boring, uh, boring times, boredom, sorry. And yeah, and maybe we are not very used to get bored in digital platforms and during those meetings. I don't know. Yeah, I think boredom is a really interesting thing to think about in terms of meaning and generating meaning. Um, what happens when there's no um, 
you know what happens in those moments of boredom is that your mind starts being used in other ways like you were saying about experiencing silence together yeah i i don't know why but to me it, it looks like it has another weight uh when this moment of silence when we we are using those platforms because to me it, those moments uh leads directly to um a moment of embarrassment <laughs> and you, yeah you, <laughs> I, you, i can't hear oh, you alex uh, alex you're switched off do you think it's more embarrassing online or offline online or, for sure online on, yeah online more embarrassing yeah 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 Be i think that that's also because um I don't know we online we we can always have an excuse to to not participate directly uh, but when we are in a real space you have to because even if you don't speak even if you uh, don't do anything at all you're present physically uh, you cannot go to the bathroom you cannot eat you cannot uh, doing something else and you will be still present in a way because we, even if i go now to the bathroom i will be still present as um, an icon on the computer how many people have gone to the bathroom during I think, I think that's one of the joys of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's a positive, not very many. I'm, I'm very aware that we're down to our last five minutes. We're, we're due to finish the conversation at 7.30. I know this is a conversation that can't go much, much longer than this. And I just wanted to thank everyone who's been here, who's taken part. Uh, Candice, thank you so much for organizing, curating the whole event, but also specifically this, this, this uh, event tonight. Um, and, uh, and thank you. Uh, panelists for joining us and and being so generous in your views. Um, it's perhaps um, telling that there's been so much to talk about on on this topic. Uh, it, it reflects very well on the whole show on Transference TV, but also on uh, uh, on the fact that I think as a group of artists. Um, so one of the connections is in, in, in our experience of the now and the experience of what's happening. And, and there seems to be the, uh, an ability to talk across um, courses, across students in, in a way that's very, very fluid. And that's really beautiful to see. Um, or, and I'm sure it comes with loads of frustrations. I'm not trying to minimize that, but, but, but at least within that very frustrating, difficult, painful moment, we've managed to sort of have a connection. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And, and thank you to um, all our panellists as well. Um, it was very much kind of brought about by the students who they wanted to have this event. So it's led by you and um, it wouldn't be without you. Uh, you know, we need you and, and your work and your ideas. And it's all incredibly valuable and important um, to expand these discussions and to think about them within the work that you're making. Um, and maybe to, to close, maybe each of our panelists might like to kind of just have um, a closing um, thought or statement, maybe in relation to uh, this conversation or, or something more related to the site. Um, but Michaela, you're at the top of my Zoom screen, so we'll start with you and then you can pass the baton on. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, obviously, I think there seems to be a lot of this conversation has kind of shifted into the the digital versus like the real world and, and you know connection and lack of connection but i think really what what this show and what's going on right now is saying is we need to kind of adapt and i think we need we need to be aware of everything and embrace it and i think we need to put more effort into keep looking for more connections you know, if this is if this is how it is, you know, if you don't like the digital, find new ways of connecting in real life too. But I think as artists, we're more than capable of doing it. So I really feel like everyone should um, kind of just relax and just take it one moment at a time, and and it'll it'll come together. Um, I'll pass it on to Shivani. And we've got like maybe five six seconds each. <laughs> 
and sorry. Yeah, thank you, Michaela. I, I couldn't agree more. And what this panel has brought out in today's discussion, which has been very rich, is that there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of opportunities. Where there's problems, there's opportunities. And artists, we have to keep the dialogue open. We have to keep trying new things. And we have to perhaps use art as our currency to stay inspired and to inspire everybody. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'm just aware oh, of time and we're going to get cut John. off. Does anyone have any like quick <laughs> notes? Just, um, I'll just say try and do as many good deeds as possible when you're out and about, if you're out and about, and just be nice. Be gentle to each other and yourselves. I think that's most important. Yeah, I think one of the things I would say um, regarding to this digital moment is to try to have a more systemic view on the problems and on the different issues and to try to have some kind of critical thinking and, and trying to, to. Oh, we've lost you. Oh, okay. Albert, uh, I'm coming quickly. Albert, you've got five seconds. Go, go, go. Yeah, Candice, the breathe, the be, the hear, the listen. Let's do it in our classes as well. Let's do it in all our collaborate meetings because I don't see that much there and I would love to see more of it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, everybody. I've just put the link to the after party that starts at 8 p.m. Um, into the chat. And we're um, going to be cutting off our live stream through Transference TV now. Um, a, big, a big sort of thumbs up to what Cam and John just said about good deeds and gentleness and kindness. I think there would be a really interesting conversation for us to have around, around just those, that theme, those themes, those ways of being. I'd love to carry on this conversation with all of you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And it's my birthday today and I couldn't have <gasps> been a nicer way to get my birthday. I <laughs> forgot to wish Happy you birthday, birthday. Alex. Happy birthday, Alex. <laughs> Brought your cake, it's right there. Hey. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Candice. That was great. Thanks.